Thank you very much. Uh, let me let me first of all extend my formal thanks to uh, Father Keith D'Souza for extending this invitation to deliver the Ambedkar Lecture, and my thanks to all the students uh, who have uh, labored to put it together and who have um, come to attend the lecture, even though it's virtual. It would have been nice to have delivered it in person, but I think under the circumstances, I think we can still manage quite well. So um, the subject of the talk today, as has been mentioned, is the architecture of protest. The Constitution, Nonviolence, and Activism. And I want to begin with a parable. I suspect that most of you will be familiar with this, but there may be some who are not. But I think even if you're familiar with it, it will be worthwhile thinking about that as a starting point. This parable is drawn from an Indian folk tale, which traveled all over the world. It's a parable about the six blind men and the elephant. And this story, as I said, has gone around the world over the centuries. So there are six blind men. And since they're blind, they've never seen an elephant. And they're each asked to describe what they think an elephant is like. So one man moves his hand across the elephant's body. It's so wide. And he says, the elephant must be a wall. The second felt its tusk, felt the sharpness of the tusk and said, the elephant must be a spear. A third felt the elephant's ears and said, the elephant is like a fan. A fourth felt its tail and said, the elephant is akin to a rope. The fifth touched the beast's trunk and thought the elephant must be like a snake. like the trunk of a tree, so right. So what is the point of the story? The point of the story is the elephant is a very large animal. Each person touched only one part of the elephant. And so though each person is partially right and partially wrong. Now, the Jains have a word to describe the philosophy with which this parable is associated. That philosophy is called Anek Anantavad, the many sidedness of perspective, the many sidedness of truth. No one is possessed of the entire truth. No single statement describes the nature of existence and the absolute truth. And I would say that Mohandas Gandhi, in fact, thought of Satyagra in this vein, because what is Satyagra? Satyagra is a method that was designed to elicit the truth in the opponent's point of view, not merely to assert the truth of one's position, as one saw it, but rather, in fact, I'm just waiting for the, yeah, okay. But rather to, in fact, as I said, to determine the element of truth that there may be in the position of the other person. And that is one reason why Satyagra is a long process and the process begins with what we might describe as a certain kind of fact finding. I mean, if you think of what Gandhi did at Champaran, so when he comes back from South Africa in 1915, one of the first local satyagras that he gets involved in the first local campaign is in Champaran. There's the Ahmedabad mill worker strike, there's a Champaran, you know, where, where a man called Shukla had come to him actually and said that, you know, the peasants are suffering in area. And what did Gandhi do? He went to that area and rather than simply say that, well, I believe in what you're saying to the peasants, what he attempted to do was to ascertain the truth. He and his team of people took down the testimonies of a thousand people. And they also spoke to the commissioner, the officials, because 
there may be something of truth in their position too, right? So I would urge us at the very outset to keep this parable in mind at a time particularly when the ideological divide is so sharp virtually all over the world. It's certainly very sharp in India and it's very sharp in the United States, the two countries I know the best, but I follow events in large parts of the world. And that is a position in many countries today. So what is the task before us today? In the month of May, I delivered three lectures for the Kerala State Government Higher Education Council, since they gave me the honor or distinction of designating me a scholar under what they call their erudite program. In those three talks, I focused on Bacha Khan, or as he's also known in India, Frontier Gandhi, on the worldwide emerging architecture of street protest, where I focused on Hong Kong and Myanmar, and finally, in my third talk on the Shaheen Bagh movement. Now, you will find all of these three talks on my YouTube channel. And the talk that I'm doing today, as you will see, is very different. Because the architecture of protest I have in mind at the present moment is a rather different one. My principal interest today is sharing with you some thoughts on the contemporary political activism in India, the future of nonviolence in such protests, and to what degree the constitution must be a weapon or could be a weapon in these struggles for justice, liberty, and equality. And to what degrees the constitution may actually be viewed as being inadequate, inadequate for such struggles. In so doing, I want to state at the outset that it will be necessary to work with the legacy of both Ambedkar and Gandhi we may not wish to confine ourselves to these two men in our work, in our thinking, but we cannot do without either of them. This is of course one reason I began with the parable because many of the Ambedkarites and the Dalits especially today are hostile to the idea that there is anything that we can recover in Gandhi. In my view, that is a deeply mistaken view. Consequently, it will be useful to begin with suggesting in what respects Gandhi and Ambedkar are in fact actually quite alike. And, and, and all of this is with reference to the subject today, rather than in the broadest terms. And in this respect, we may consider their view on minorities and the safeguards for minorities, the question of organized religion, and why a political democracy is not at all the same as a democracy on the ground. That is a democracy that is an economic, cultural, social, and judicial democracy. It is of course on the question of caste that Ambedkar and Gandhi had radically different views. But I would go so far as to say that on many other questions where they are viewed as holding extremely contrary views, the differences between them are not necessarily that sharp. As an example, only as an example, we may consider Ambedkar's sharply critical account of village republics in ancient and pre-colonial India. In his introduction to the draft constitution, which was introduced in the Constituent Assembly on 4th November, 1948, Ambedkar dismissed the criticism of the draft constitution that no part of it represents the ancient polity of India. So that was a critique given by particularly by some members of the constituent assembly that who were more inclined to, if I may put it this way, a Hindu kind of view. And they said, well, Ambedkar has really ignored the fact that we had village republics in India, in ancient India, and we had democratic systems. The love of the intellectual Indians wrote Ambedkar with evident and unconcealed derision. The ridicule and the tone is remarkable. The love of the intellectual Indians for the village republic is of course infinite, if not pathetic, he says. The village republics had survived to be sure, but Ambedkar did not doubt that they have been the ruination of India. <laughs> 
His view here is said to contrast with that of Gandhi, who has been described very often as idolizing the Indian village. I think there is but no question that this is in fact a gross misrepresentation of Gandhi's idea of the village. We have to remember that not only was Gandhi preeminently a man of the city in many ways. Remember that after he comes back from South Africa, where does he settle down? He settles down in Ahmedabad and he makes his second home, practically speaking, in Bombay. I'm using the word that was used then, of course, now it's called Mumbai, but I'm speaking about the colonial period. Of practically a second home at what is now the Gandhi Museum, Mani Bhavan, in Bombay. But it is not only that. When Ambedkar writes, what is the village but a sink of localism, a den of ignorance, narrow-mindedness and communalism, we can say that Gandhi would have been in agreement with much, though not all of that, and certainly not with Ambedkar's assessment of the village as a site of communalism. Gandhi had been to far too many villages not to realize in his own words that most Indian villages presented the unpleasant spectacles of dung heaps. Dung heap is Gandhi's word, not mine. Right. So I'm saying that this is an illustration where one imagines the difference between them as enormous, but in fact, it is not. Let me, however, turn to some fundamental points of agreement between Ambedkar and Gandhi, speaking in the broadest terms that are applicable to the subject under discussion today. First, Gandhi and Ambedkar were both agreed that political rights and political democracy are insufficient. I would go so far as to say as a little footnote that in India, we cannot even speak of a political democracy. All we can speak of is an electoral democracy. That's all at the moment. Now, this is what Ambedkar said in his speech of 25th November, 1949. Okay, The previous speech that I quoted from is a year earlier. That is when the draft constitution, in case some of you are not familiar with how all of this worked, so there was a con constituent assembly that was appointed in late 1946. A draft constitution is prepared. That draft constitution is put before the entire constituent assembly because there had been a drafting committee. And that, and that draft constitution is then subjected to extensive discussion for one entire year. And over 300 amendments are proposed and each of them is discussed in detail. We don't have in the present parliament even an iota of that level of discussion, not even 1%. And of course, I would go so far as to say that fewer than 1% of the people in parliament have the level of education or literacy or intellectual interest required to undertake the kind of discussion that was undertaken in those days. But this is what Ambedkar said in his speech now of 25th November 1949, which is his last speech before the Constituent Assembly and before the Constitution was formally adopted. And of course, as all of you know, it is on 26 January 1950 that India officially became a republic. So what does he say? He says, and I quote, political democracy cannot last unless there lies at the base of this social democracy. What does social democracy mean? It means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of life. They form a union of trinity in the sense that to divorce one from the other is to defeat the very purpose of democracy. Without equality, liberty would produce the supremacy of the few over the many. Without fraternity, liberty would produce the supremacy of the few over the many. Without fraternity, liberty and equality could not become a natural course of things. It would require a constable to enforce them. And he concludes this paragraph by saying on the 26th of January, 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we have 
equality, we will have equality because of course India was going to have universal franchise among other things. And in social and economic life, we will have inequality. Unambiguous, the way he puts it, in politics, we will have equality and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall by reason of our social and economic structure continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we continue to live this life of contradictions? In an article that Gandhi wrote for Harijan on 27th January, 1948, three days before he was assassinated, he stated unequivocally, and I quote, the Congress has won political freedom, but it has yet to win economic freedom, social and moral freedom. Those freedoms are harder than the political, if only because they are constructive, less exciting, and not spectacular." End quote. He reinforces the argument in the draft constitution of the Congress that he was writing at the time of his death. And I think I should say that far too many Indians are not aware of the fact that he called for the dissolution of the Congress as a political party that it no longer had any reason to survive as a political party and it should be reborn as a national service organization. A lok seva sank. The Congress in its present shape and form, he writes, that is as a propaganda vehicle and parliamentary machine has outlived its use, India's has still to attain social, moral, and economic independence." End quote. Now you can see the congruence between his view and the view of Ambedkar. Secondly, on the question of minority rights, it has to be said that both Gandhi and Ambedkar lived for the day when the very idea of a minority would disappear, when it would dissolve. What do I mean by that? There are two considerations here. Though neither may have said this explicitly, they share an insight on the very language of majority and minority. This language of majority and minority is a modern form of political arithmetic. In other words, it has now become a question of numbers since the 19th century, but the only proper assessment that we can furnish is where we consider what it means in philosophical and psychological terms to think of what is a minority and therefore what is a majority. So if you take the Parsis and the Jews, and the city where the vast majority of you are located is a city where, of course, we found both Parsis and Jews. Of course, Jews in much smaller numbers, but as some of you are familiar with the history of Judaism in India, may be familiar with the fact that there are very distinct, if small, and of course, they have become much smaller now. Now they're absolutely minuscule, but there have been very distinct Jewish communities in India which go back 2,000 years. And every scholar of World Judaism will tell you that the one country in the world where there was never any instance of anti-Semitism was India. Did the Jews in India think of themselves as a minority? See, numerically, of course they are, but people don't always think of themselves numerically. This is one of the things that happened when the census came into India in colonial India. The census put us into what is called an enumerative world. The Parsis are actually largely responsible for building up Bombay, particularly in the 19th century, because of the particular role they played, among other things, in the opium trade. Did the Parsis always 
think of themselves as a minority. My submission to you is they did not. Whereas what is extraordinarily interesting is that the Hindus in India today, and I'm a Hindu myself, so I'm speaking as a Hindu, who constitute 79% of the population, often act and talk as though they were a minority, constantly complaining that we are being besieged by the Muslims. The Muslims have laid siege, the, the government is appeasing the Muslims, et cetera, et cetera. So where we are saying is that a group of people that is a numerical majority actually thinks of itself as a minority, whereas groups of people in India who have been numerical minorities actually had the confidence of a majority. So this is a very modern form of political arithmetic and Ambedkar and Gandhi were two people who understood that very well. This is what I meant that eventually the idea is you dissolve the notion of minority altogether. If you dissolve the notion of minority, you dissolve the notion of the majority as well, right? But nonetheless, both of them, of course, understand politics on the ground. So both of them insisted on rights and protections for minorities. It has been said, says Gandhi, it has been said, that Indian Swaraj will be the rule of the majority community, that is the Hindus. And he continues, there could not be a greater mistake than that. If it were to be true, I for one would refuse to call it Swaraj and would fight it with all the strength at my command. For to me, Hind Swaraj is the rule of all the people. It's the rule of justice, end quote. Gandhi repeatedly said this and is on record for saying it. And it seems almost superfluous for me to say that Ambedkar would have agreed with the general thrust of the sentiment on display here. The same part of the rights of minorities had, after all, been central to Ambedkar's interventions. It is a different matter, but I will turn to this later, that he would not have agreed with Gandhi's faith in, quote, the rule of all the people. What is clear in their sense in their sense, however, is that safeguards for the minority are absolutely necessary, and both of them were in complete agreement with that view. Thirdly, as I conclude this portion of my talk, outlining some of the areas of agreement between Gandhi and Ambedkar, and this is a point on which I should not dwell too long as it is less germane, less relevant to the larger argument about the nature of this resistance and the future of Satyagraha in a parliamentary democracy. Both of them could not envision life without religion. This is a, a point very much common to both. Indeed, in some fashion, we may even say with some caveats, organized religion. I have explored Gandhi's religious views at length and will not describe them at great detail here. It is sufficient to say for you to understand the nature of my argument that Gandhi always believed himself to be a Hindu. He described himself as a believer in Sanatan Dharam, but his conception of religion was exceedingly ecumenical. The interfaith prayer meeting was virtually invented by him. And it is a wonderful guide to his religious ecumenism. What, how does one become, for Gandhi, a better Hindu? Or how does one become a better Muslim? And this is what he says. He says, the Hindu who prays that the Muslim will become a better Muslim, that I will become a better Hindu, the Christian will become a better Christian, and so on. That's the kind of Hindu I want. What kind of Muslim do I want? The Muslim who prays, not that the Hindu will convert and become a Muslim, but the Hindu will become a better Hindu. The Buddhist will become a better Buddhist. The Muslim will become a better Buddhist. That is his conception, actually, if I may put it this way, of secularism. Because the Gandhian view was you can only be truly secular if you're grounded in a religion. 
Now, it sounds very paradoxical, but in some respects, it was a view shared by Ambedkar. Because you all will have to ask yourself, why is it that Ambedkar, who famously said, I was born a Hindu, but I will not die a Hindu. Right? He famously says that, but he doesn't abandon religion. What does he do towards the end of his life, just months before he dies? He converts to Buddhism and he leads half a million Dalits in a mass conversion in Nagpur. Because the house of religion was preeminently important for Ambedkar as it was for Mohandas Gandhi. Ambedkar did not turn to, to Bhakti. He did not become a California style spiritual, you know, right? Who believes in everything and nothing therefore. He did not become a so-called Sufi. He becomes a Buddhist, grounded in a religion, very much so. And on the way to that, he also rejects Marxism. He has a wonderful essay, Buddha or Marx, where he describes how he was attracted to certain points of view of within Marxism, but found that whatever Marxism had, Buddhism had as well, from his point of view. Yes, of course, Buddhism didn't have in the, in the technical sense a critique of fetishism, the market commodity, not in those technical terms, but that the social principles behind Marxism were principles from Ambedkar's stand, standpoint that were already contained within Buddhism. And then Buddhism had things that Marxism did not have. Right? So house of religion was very important. And this is something that he very much shared with Gandhi. Now, moving into the next phase of my talk, it is also necessary to reflect because this has implications for the question of activism and dissent and nonviolence today on the sharp differences between Gandhi and Ambedkar. I will advert to two main issues here one on the future of nonviolent activism and rebellion in a parliamentary democracy, and secondly, the role of the state in a democratic polity. In advancing these arguments, I will be touching upon some ancillary points as well. What was Ambedkar's position? He outlines it unequivocally in that last speech before the Constituent Assembly on 25th November 1949. And I quote, if we wish to maintain democracy, not merely in form, but also in fact, what must we do? The first thing, this is, I'm, I'm quoting Ambedkar, remember. The first thing in my judgment we must do is hold fast to constitutional methods of achieving our social and economic objectives. It means we must abandon the bloody methods of revolution. It means that we must abandon the method of civil disobedience, non-cooperation and satyagraha when there was no way left for constitutional methods for achieving economic and social objectives, there was a great deal of justification for unconstitutional methods. He's referring, of course, to colonial India and saying that Satyagraha was frankly unconstitutional, but since Indians did not have a course, it was fine at that time. But now that we have a parliamentary democracy, we must abandon the method of civil disobedience, non-cooperation, and satyagraha. Where constitutional methods are open, there can be no justification for these unconstitutional methods. These methods are nothing but the grammar of anarchy. And the sooner they are abandoned, the better for us, end quote. And I have to say that on this point, I think Ambedkar is entirely incorrect, entirely incorrect. And we will see that Gandhi, of course, had a different view. All you have to do, by the way, is you have to think of examples, serious examples, which show the limitations of working within constitutional democracy and also show where in modern times, the language of Satyagraha 
was used in a parliamentary democracy. The best example of, of the latter, of course, is the American civil rights movement. The United States was a democracy. Ambedkar understood that. He recognized that. Of course, when he wrote this, this was before the civil rights movement started. But he's already said that we must abandon the methods of civil disobedience, non-cooperation, and satyagra. And I can tell you the American civil rights movement, not just Martin Luther King, every single leader there had studied extensively what Gandhi had done in India. The greatest teachers of non-violent practice in the civil rights movement studied Gandhi's works in detail. And that's how they built up that movement. Ambedkar's view does not allow for this kind of possibility. You can also take the other view, which is you can take the view of something like the Weimar Republic, right? Some of, some of you may not be familiar with what I'm speaking about here. I'm speaking about the Republic, which is called the Weimar Republic that came into existence in Germany when Germany lost World War I. At the end of World War I, what came into being was what was called the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic, in principle lasts till 1933. Its constitutional structure was retained entirely by Adolf Hitler. Most people don't understand that. They think that what Hitler was doing was completely illegal. Every single thing that Adolf Hitler did was legitimized by the constitution in Germany. There's a scholar called Ingo Mueller who has written a book, which I first read when it came out 22 years ago, Hitler's Justice. Even the, even the title should make you think, because of course, we don't think of Hitler and the word justice together. It was only injustice. But what she's arguing is that the courts functioned. Even at the time that the Germans are Nazis are engaging in mass killings, they still had a system of functioning courts, which from their point of view, dispense justice according to the constitution. And this kind of thing, it appears to me, Ambedkar did not fully understand, All right? We can also say, of course, that Gandhi as the author of the idea of Satyagraha would not have disowned Satyagraha. He understood that Satyagraha in a parliamentary democracy, as opposed to colonial India, where your rulers are the oppressors, right? that Satyagraha in a parliamentary democracy would not work exactly the same way. Nonetheless, Satyagraha may be, may be applied as much to the family as he had always argued, as it may be applied against the state, even a constitutional state, a parliamentary democracy, right? He does not write on the future of Satyagraha as a political movement in post-independent India as such, but you can infer his position also from this remarkable statement that he makes in 1936, when a delegation of four African-Americans came to visit him in Sevagram. This delegation was led by a black theologian by the name of Howard Thurman. And they have a remarkable conversation. That conversation is available both in Thurman's autobiography and it is available in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. And the most pertinent thing there is that Gandhi says to Howard Thurman in 1936, at the end of their conversation, he says, I dare say that it appears to me that the next great chapter in the history of Satyagraha will most likely be written by your people. These African-Americans are living in a constitutional democracy called the United States of America. And he's saying to Thurman, your people are most likely to now carry Satyagraha forward, which is exactly, of course, what is going to happen. He is therefore envisioning a future for Satyagra for nonviolent activism and resistance in a democracy, something that Ambedkar had rejected. And secondly, and this point 
two speaks directly to the issues before us. Ambedkar and Gandhi had substantially different impressions of the role of the state. Gandhi was deeply suspicious of the state. He believed that the state represents violence in a concentrated and organized form. I think he's entirely correct. This was not, by the way, an insight that was original to him, but he came about it in his own way because of his own thinking. He understood that the state is everywhere the largest purveyor of violence. How can the very entity that is responsible for the greatest violence be trusted with safeguarding the rights of its citizens and particularly dissenting citizens? The state is not even a human entity. It has no soul. It thrives on violence. It has an appetite for growing at the expense of other entities. We do not know of states that contract. States never contract. And state power never contracts. It only grows. It only grows. Freedom inheres, therefore, from Gandhi's standpoint, in the people, in their own capacity for self-rule. Since the idea of a majority and minority form no part of his thinking, it goes without saying that by the people he meant not just Hindus in the case of India, but all Indians. For Ambedkar, quite obviously the stakes were very different. It would have been intolerable to him to see the Dalits being ruled by a Hindu majority at the dawn of independence. And the state therefore had to be entrusted with the task of procuring what he called constitutional morality. I want you to note the phrase constitutional morality. Such constitutional morality was to be legislated and legalized. If for example, let's say we believe, say that we believe in reservations and we rely upon the constitution to mandate such reservations on the grounds that such reservations are necessary to undo centuries of privilege for the upper castes, we are in such a situation resorting to constitutional morality. That is a morality backed up by the force of the constitution, by the force of law. Ambedkar was quite certain that such constitutional morality was moreover necessary because the Hindu derived his morality from traditional sources, what we might call caste morality, or the morality and social order handed down by the caste system. <clears throat> in presenting the draft constitution to the Constituent Assembly on 4th November 1948, Ambedkar said, and I quote, constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. We must realize that our people have yet to learn it. And now just listen to this last line of this quote. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic, end quote. From Ambedkar's point of view, the document that was being created, that is a constitution, was far more enlightened than the society for which that document was being drafted. It was to use his words from his resignation speech after he stepped down as the law minister in post-independent India over differences that developed between him and the Hindu faction over the Hindu court bill. To use his words, the constitution given to Indians was to like, it was like building a palace on a dung heap. Those are Ambedkar's words. To build a palace on a dung heap, end quote. To this extent, I would say, however unpleasant it may sound, Ambedkar did not repose much, if any, confidence in the people of India to right wrongs. The constitution that was being given to them was to use his words once again, akin to building a palace on a dung heap. Let me then move to 
the second and much shorter part of my presentation. Now, I have already signaled to you my own view that with regards to the matter of nonviolent resistance of Satyagraha, I very much hold to the view, not merely that it has a future, but even more strongly that resistance movements the world over and especially in India have shown that nonviolent resistance alone has a future. I am hard pressed to think of violent revolutions that have produced outcomes that can be viewed as desirable. But let us press the point with a brief examination of the Shaheen Bagh movement and very briefly, the farmers movement. One of the more remarkable features of the countrywide protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act, the CAA and the NRC, the National Register of Citizens, surely has to be the fact that women have taken the lead in signaling their dissent against the heavy handedness of the Indian state and the increasing encroachment upon constitutional liberties. Perhaps in describing this as remarkable, I may be thought by some to be doing only if inadvertently women a disservice and suggesting that they have not been prominent in previous civil disobedience movements. That is of course not the case. They were highly visible in the demonstrations that took place all over the country in the wake of the brutal sexual assault against Nirbe, for example, just as they were in 2004, when 12 women, the mothers of Manipur, stripped themselves naked in public to highlight the sexual violation of a young girl. And more generally, the ongoing and systemic problem of sexual violence against women. But of course, Shaheen Bagh was different because Shaheen Bagh was not a set of issues that revolved around, quote, women's issues, or only the security of women, right? And here I'm, I'm going to skip great deal because as I said, I've spoken about Shaheen Bagh in, in considerable detail, but the Shaheen Bagh movement is extraordinarily important because it extends the insights of Gandhi for our age. One of the most extraordinary things about Shaheen Bagh is the fact that it did not have a singular leader. In fact, it's not clear that it had any leaders as such. All right. So let me give you a little bit of a description. The What was Shaheen Bagh? I'm sure that most of you are aware, but some of you may have forgotten some of the nature of this. The women of Shaheen Bagh, which is a predominantly Muslim neighborhood in Delhi's Jamia Nagar, had been waging a silent demonstration against CAA and NRC since mid-December of 2019. And I can, I can anticipate myself by saying that the government made every effort to shut this movement down and failed. And how did it come to a halt? It came to a halt because on March 24th, our prime minister announced at 8 p.m. that there was going to be a countrywide lockdown, which was going to be enforced with four hours notice. And that anyone found outside was immediately subject to imprisonment. Why? Because the government of India invoked the Epidemic Diseases Act, I've written a book on COVID published on October 2020 called The Fury of COVID-19, okay, where I discuss this. And the Epidemic Diseases Act was by ordinance brought into effect. This is a colonial era legislation and it gives the state extraordinary powers in the name of addressing a public health emergency. And so at midnight, the country is locked down. At 2 a.m., the police went to Jamia Nagar, to Shaheen Bagh, went to the university as well, Jamia, and they whitewashed all the murals and removed every sign of protest within three hours. Just removed everything within three hours. This has been white, this has been documented. Right? Now, what did these women do going back to December? They occupied a portion of the main highway connecting the city to Noida. Some women did not go home for days. Others were accompanied at the sit-in by their children. I visited 
Shaheen Bagh, because I was, I'm always in India in the winters before the pandemic and you in the summers as well. And so I went to Shaheen Bagh and some of the slides I'm going to share with you in just a few moments were all photographs that I had taken myself. So I saw this for myself, but of course, there are many other witnesses. It's all been documented. Some of these women were illiterate, but they nonetheless understood what was at stake in the government plan to roll out a nationwide NRC. They understood that women are even more vulnerable because property papers in India are generally in the name of men. And many of these women didn't even have the papers to prove Indian citizenship. Their very presence, grit and disciplined resistance gives the lie to the claim that the demonstrations had been fueled by, quote, the opposition or outside instigators. This is a favorite tactic of the state everywhere in the world. When you have demonstrations of this kind, you always say, outside instigators. Right? That women have been at the helm of a nonviolent affirmation of the constitutional promise of equality under the law and nonviolent resistance to state oppression would have come as no surprise to Mohandas Gandhi. He had been a keen observer of the suffragette movement in Britain and as early as 1907, long before he returned to India, wrote a piece in Gujarati called Brave Women in their defense. Women were, in his view, naturally predisposed towards nonviolence. And I can elaborate upon that, but I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. What I'm suggesting is that if you study Shaheen Bagh, and you know, by the way, there were Shaheen Baghs in the plural that came up all over India, all over, 300 Shaheen Baghs, that this was a considerable advance in our age in a parliamentary democracy of the idea of Satyagraha. Now, let me take up the example very briefly of the farmers' movement for two, three minutes, and then I'll move to my concluding paragraph. With the rebellion of the farmers, which commenced nearly two years ago, a new front was opened up in the battle of the country's ordinary citizens against state power. State power against what is really an authoritarian government that has little, if any, tolerance for the idea of dissent. The farmers of Punjab and Haryana and increasingly of the, of the rest of India took to the streets and rattled the government, if ever so slightly. And here, I just want to table aside for a moment that there is an architecture of what I call the street. The street is emerging as a major site all over the world. So in my Kerala lectures, my second lecture was looking very carefully at some of the strategies that were adopted by street activists in Myanmar and in Hong Kong. How they use, for example, umbrellas. Not, you, you, some of you may be familiar with the umbrella movement, but it's astonishing the ingenuity which they use an everyday object to create a whole grammar of rebellion. A new grammar of rebellion, entirely nonviolent, entirely nonviolent. That's the critical point, right? Now the Shaheen Bagh protesters had been pilloried as anti-national. It was easy to do that because for one thing, they were Muslim women. And so of course, if they're Muslims, you can paint them and their supporters, that is students, uh, liberals, human rights activists, and sometimes just people committed only to the notion that India must be hospitable to all, right? That all of these people were pilloried as destroying the social fabric of Indian society. You heard the phrases that were, began to circulate. Khan market gang, tukre tukre, right? All of that. Farmers, however, are not so easily dismissed. And so, you know, th this is a subject for a very long discussion. The middle class view of Shaheen Bagh and the middle class view of the farmers' movement is quite different. Because ultimately, you know, the middle class view of farmers was, of course, some, I'm describing some of it, not all of it, was that, well, they are, after all, Kisan, because Kisan to mehnat karte and they're honest people, you know, right? And remember, 
I mean, the students here are ob ob obviously far too young. You wouldn't have been born at the time of Lal Bahadur Shastri. But remember his slogan, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan. Right? So you see, the farmers' movement in that sense already was iconically in a different place than the Shaheen Bagh movement. Right? But what is very clear is, and again, I don't have the time to really look at the movement in detail and to look at all the strategies that they deployed and all of that, and the fact that they had to fight the same insinuation of outsiders, Khalistanis. It was said that it had been infiltrated by the Khalistanis. Well, you know, if you have one or two Khalistanis among 10,000 people, it's not been infiltrated by the Khalistanis. This is the nature of social movements. People will join for all kinds of reasons, and some people will actually take the opportunity to exploit the movement. But we know that that is what the movement was not. This was, in fundamental ways, a grassroots kind of movement. Right? And once again, it displayed extraordinary ingenuity. And how it was managed and what it was able to deliver at that time. All right. And one should also bear in mind that apart from the question of what one's view is about the three farmers' bills, there is a separate question because some people said, well, but the bills may actually be beneficial. Of course, there were scholars who disputed that. But it is genuinely possible to take a view. I'm saying that some scholars thought that these bills actually are good for Indian agriculture, because I think there is a general consensus that Indian agriculture is in a very bad state. But the question before us is a different question. It is not whether the bills were legitimate or not. The question is the right of farmers to protest. And was that right being abrogated? Because what did the state do? It dug up holes in the, in the streets. It put up perimeters. Make, they used the kind of barbed wire that you use in concentration camps. Right? Th that's the question before us. Not whether the bills were actually, apart from the fact that the bills were introduced without any discussion during the pandemic which is a, a, another problem, all right? But let me, I think you get the drift of what I'm saying. So let me therefore move to my concluding paragraph. And I also want to share a few slides because that concluding paragraph makes an argument with which I want to sum up. This architecture that I am describing of protest and dissent will require all the resources of the people of India, if it is to be sustained over a period of time to rebirth the republic that we have largely lost. I suspect that nothing encapsulates the promise of that moment at the farmer's movement, as much as the remarks of the young Sikh actor Deep Sidhu, captured in a video as he addresses and reprimands a uniformed security officer this is no way of handling such an agitation, he tells that officer. Ye inkalab hai, sir, ye inkalab hai. This is a revolution. So let me elaborate on the point that the architecture will require all the resources of the people of India. In the common understanding, the young revolutionary Bhagat Singh and Gandhi had an antagonistic relationship to each other. Just think for a second of this terrible film that has done so well in India. It's, it's broken all records. It's called RRR. I mean, it's a horrendously bad film, okay? Some of you may have seen it. And at the end of the film, there is this galaxy of freedom fighters that he brings forward. Bhagat Singh, Subhash Bose, Sardar Patel, couple of RSS people, some of Bhagat Singh's friends, Sukhdev, Rajguru. Guess who's missing? From all those who contributed to the freedom struggle of India, Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, nowhere to be seen. Now that's not my objection. My 
problem, apart from the fact that the screenwriter and the film director have no understanding about what we call the language of cinema. La cinema has a language. It's, it's shock and awe. It's like visual spectacles. It's like the Chinese, when Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, what did they do? Send hundreds of planes, do this drill, make a lot of noise. It's just a lot of noise. That's what it is. The problem was that the people who made that film, they simply believe that there is a purely antagonistic relationship between Gandhi and Bhagat Singh, for example, because Bhagat Singh is a true revolutionary from their point of view. And of course, I would have to ask, please explain to me, why is it that when Bhagat Singh threw the bomb in the Central Legislative Assembly, He threw it deliberately, he and Batukeshwar Dutt, who accompanied him, they threw it deliberately at a place where there was no one, where no one would be injured, which is exactly what happened. Not one person was injured because Bhagat Singh understood the dialectic of violence and nonviolence that the pursuit of nonviolence inescapably involves one in thinking about violence. And sometimes in the act of violence, as was the case when he threw the bomb, we may be doing homage to the idea of nonviolence by preserving the sanctity of life. Now, who's going to explain that? to the screenwriter of RRR who simply thinks Bhagat Singh to bahut bade shaheed the Gandhi to hijra tha that is their view that he was a eunuch right i'm putting it strongly but that is what they are saying today that is why nathuram godse is being celebrated right so in the common understanding the young revolutionary Bhagat Singh and Gandhi had an antagonistic relationship to each other. Similarly, in their view, Gandhi and Ambedkar had an antagonistic relationship to each other, which I suggested to you is far more complex. Bhagat Singh was an avowed atheist and a firm communist. Both Gandhi and Ambedkar disavowed communism as well as atheism, whatever their differences with each other, as we have partially explored. Bhagat Singh comes closest to being the patriot of the three. Gandhi, if I may put it this way, was too wise to be taken in by patriotism. So how does a modern day dissenter work with the legacy of all three and with the legacy of the constitution? And to see how they do that, let me just share with you a few slides, okay? So this is all from Shaheen Bagh. And these are images that I took. And now if you look at the screen there, you can see Gandhi here, you can see Maulana Azad, you see Ambedkar here, and you see Ambedkar here. Okay, and you see Subhash Bose. We also know that in the common understanding, Subhash Bose and Gandhi are viewed as having an antagonistic relationship, right? But notice that for people who are involved in this movement, they put all of them together, all right? Let's just take a look at a couple of these. And now I move very quickly to the next set, to next image. Um, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't linger over the other images. So let's look at this image over here. This is all of them again from Shaheen Bagh. So the woman here, this one here where my cursor is, she's the, here it says Mahatma Gandhi Amar Rahe, Inkalab Zindabad, Inkalab Zindabad. By the way, Inkalab Zindabad was never a slogan or cry associated with Gandhi. I'm sure that all of you are familiar. It was associated with Bhagat Singh and with the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army comrades that he had. But this puts it all together, right? And then if you see this one here, okay? So Ashwak Ullah Khan, Shaheed Bhagat Singh, right? No, notice the names here, right? Ki shahadat ko salam karo, right? Pay obeisance 
respect the martyrdom of these two people, right? And then if you see this one over here, so actually I, I can't read the whole thing because I have the, the images of some of you here on the, you know how it, it becomes. So, but here he is actually talking about Samvidan, the constitution, the constitution. This person is invoking the constitution. Notice that Bhagat Singh, Ambedkar, Subhash was the constitution, Gandhi, and look at this one here, right? Sanji Shahabdat, Sanji Virasat, right? And you see Bhagat Singh and you see Mahatma Gandhi here together. And now if you look at this one here, you see the broader context in which this, uh, 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 these posters have been put up because you also see Molana Azad, you see Ambedkar. So you see a devout Muslim, which was Molana Azad, you see a Buddhist, Ambedkar, you see Gandhi, a devout Hindu, and you see a communist and an atheist. Because that was Bhagat Singh. I mean, he openly said that, right? That was his, his position. And then if we go here to um, this image over here, we can see, of course, how the people were invoking the preamble to the Constitution of India. A lot of, of course, a lot of the people who were skeptical of the movement said, yeah, but these people don't really know the constitution. All they know is a preamble. And of course, my rejoinder was that most of the people who are complaining don't even know the preamble. At least these people know the preamble. But the point is that they understand that the constitution is a document that is meant to safeguard their rights. Okay. And now, of course, the question is, how is it, the last slide, that how is it that these people can so effortlessly use the constitution, the teachings of Ambedkar, as they understand them, the insights of Bhagat Singh, the teachings of Gandhi. When otherwise, all of these are supposed to be in sharp ideological opposition to each other. And of course, in India, we often use insights from, or scenes from Bollywood. So those of you who know the film, uh, Shole would recognize this, right? Are basanti in ko kagas mat dikhana, because you remember the kagas here is the identity card, right? And that's what, and, and of course this, this, you know, little thing done, sketch done on a paper, this here is of course Amit's, uh, Amit's uh, what's his name? Um, Amit Shah, right? So what I'm trying to suggest here is simply this. The dissenters in India are not driven by ideological purity, unlike some scholars and unlike the trolls who have become an unacknowledged army for the state today. Let me just reaffirm in closing that ideological purity is the bane of clear action and clear thought, ideological purity. If activists in India recognizes, as I hope they increasingly do, which is what the Shaheen Bagh movement suggests, what the farmers movement suggests, there is, I think, a future for dissent and democracy in India. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vinay Lal, for joining us today. We are greatly honored by your presence. Your words and views have motivated us to think much deeper and in a different light. Thank you so much for a nuanced understanding of such crucial topics. Now, our moderator for the discussion following the lecture is Dr. Agnilo Menezes. Dr. Menezes is the former principal of our college and has been teaching economics in the college in various departments. He is the head of the Department of Public Policy and coordinator of the college social involvement program. He earned his PhD from Mumbai University, where his thesis focused on the social and economic geography of urban poor, rag pickers in Mumbai, highlighting the informal economy in the recycling sector. His research interests include the Indian economy, urbanization, food insecurity, and microfinance. Without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Agnilo Menezes to take the discussion further. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Vinay, for that wonderful expose that you gave us on just telling us from the start 
that protest is like the elephant being looked at by the six blind men. I'll just try to recall what we have put up over here, and then we'll take up the question that people have put up. Um, you spoke in terms of the various kinds of democracies, electoral, political, social, economic. You went on to talk in terms of the congruence between Gandhi and Ambedkar. And then you also brought in the differences between the two. And this summed up, and this, uh, all these things added up to the idea of resistance. I think it was a very logical, very cogent kind of presentation that you put up over there when you spoke in terms of two kinds of protesters represented by Gandhiji and represented by Ambedkar. We have a set of questions, Vinay, and uh, I will go on uh, elucidating those questions. Um, please respond. I've been asked to ask you, why do you think politics shape protests and activism in India? Vinay? Well, uh, the question is, why shouldn't it? I mean, politics will shape everywhere. I, I, I'm trying to understand the real gist of the question because, of course, politics, activism is politics. But I think here it's meant by politics is, you know, party politics, for example. Yeah, why does is that, good. yeah, party politics, why does that shape? Well, there's a, there are a number of answers for that. One of, one of which is that in India, by the way, there's, one reason which you may not find to that extent in other countries, which is that in India, we know that political parties have great representation on all the campuses. And if, in, even, the, even uh, the student unions, they're all linked up to political parties. Okay, they're all linked up to political parties. So when they have a JNU student union election, uh, there are political parties that are involved in this per se. Right. So in India, the situation, because that is not necessarily the case. I mean, I've been on American university campuses and yes, we have the Democrats and Republicans, but they, they don't work the same way. This I, I don't have that kind of visibility at all at the campus level that political parties really have in India. Okay. But then, of course, there are, there are other reasons for that as well, that, that why does, for example, politics shape activism because let's say if you look at the present situation now what we have is we have a situation where there is virtually no real opposition in parliament in india today i mean the bjp has a commanding majority now that will pers per that will shape the discourse that shapes the discourse and that discourse has a necessary relationship to the kind of activity that people will engage in. I mean, it is not an accident, in other words, that the idea of a Hindu Rashtra has become prominent precisely at a time when the political party in power itself is a proponent of that. Although we must make sure of one thing, that we understand one thing. I, I think that the what I will broadly call for the sake of convenience, the left in India, progressive, liberal, left, secular-minded people, I think sometimes they pay far too much attention to the state because it seems to me the fundamental problem now, I mean, I come from a middle-class family. I come from, or from West New Delhi at a time when West New Delhi was completely looked down upon because South Delhi was where the elites were. And I, and I know the kind of people who have come out of those areas very well that this, what is called the virus of communalism has gone deep down into these families. So the argument for Hindu Rashtra is not actually, so to speak, just an argument on the part of a political party. It now lives in the imagination of far too many Hindus. Okay, so that the, the answer to that question would involve looking at all these aspects of the story. I'll just move away from the script that is given to me. And sure. since you're talking to students, since you're talking to people from campuses, uh, yeah. how do you think that we, I'm talking about we being the lecturers and all those things, the management administrators, should be looking at dissent, should we nurture it? And how do students you know, develop the sense of uh, dissent 
the way you were presented gandhi ji ambedkar yeah. uh, is dissent something that we should be nurturing i'm sure you're going to say yes i'll be i'll be saying yes but when yeah. i'm saying dissent i'm talking in terms of uh, dissent on what what do we have basically to fall back on and say students yeah. this is what you're dissenting lecture us this is what we're dissenting against like the wall street movement for example you walk out of mancus yeah. lectures Okay. okay so what do you nurture in the students all right so let me good protesters yeah so let me let me begin by invoking a 18th century european philosopher by the name of immanuel kant hmm. and the philosophy students here will certainly know and some of you others may may know as well what did kant say kant said he is writing at a time when mass education is just beginning to be seen on the horizon and the notion that the state has some obligation to provide education this is just beginning in europe at this point in time beginning and kant writes very clearly and unequivocally equivocally already at that time okay he writes that what is the function of schooling here the common view is the common view is the function of schooling is to make us all educated of course then i have to say what what does that mean because for example i think i i you know i have a habit of being very bold so you'll have to excuse me for that but i think for example that engineers nearly all over the world are not educated they are just trained there is a difference between being trained and between being educated right and i i think that training has been so deficient that it has made them incapable of thinking in cultural moral categories now you go back to kant what he says is that we think that schooling actually is intended to educate people to become citizens and he says there couldn't be a more grossly mistaken idea the idea of educate of schooling he says is to make you become an obedient subject obey notice that down to the present day students who obey their teacher are rewarded students who disobey are punished at back in my father's generation that punishment meant ki do teen thappad lag gaye you could be whipped now of course in good schools that's not possible because that's you know abusing the child all of that so you're not supposed to obviously you know administer corporal punishment to them right but still you get punished in some fashion or the other if you disobey the onus is on be obeying so the first onus from my point of view is to think about how schooling right from the outset and here i'm not speaking just of india i'm speaking about the late 18th century right down to the present day the onus on that has been to produce obedient subjects now of course marxism will add various twists because these are also supposed to be productive citizens so we'd have to look at the whole ethos of productivity what it means to be productive etc cetera, etc cetera. right and i'm ans I'm, i'm answering your question because we have to think in broader categories before we get to something called dissent because dissent is really only possible it seems to me when we start to reflect and we start to think about what it is that we what is the nature of pedagogy what is the nature of education all right and now speaking about my own practices so there are many practices it would take a whole day to get into the whole pedagogy of my teaching but i'll give you very simple illustrations for example i have in 30 years of teaching completely rejected the idea of a textbook i think the textbook is the first thing that needs to be thrown out the textbook homogenizes students why do we have textbooks the first thing a nation state does when it becomes an independent country it produces an authorized version of its own history which is then replicated in something called the textbook okay now of course you have to give them books so typically i'll have 50 60 readings for an introductory class we'll say four different readings on one subject let the authors clash with each other and then we try to elicit what is true in each position because i do believe 
in what I had started out with. I have increasingly come to believe that today. I'm not going to say that I believed in that 30 years ago. I was far too confident then. I'm becoming much and less certain about what I know as I move along. And now my thrust is let the points of view clash, not in the, not in the view from the point of view that they are all equal. I don't think that is the case. After all, one has one, one's own position and one should, but it has to be a position that one has derived after some degree of reflection, some degree of reading, some degree of exchange with other critically engaged minds, whether in person or through other texts or through other forms, right? So part of the pedagogy here is to essentially do that. Part of the pedagogy is to do the what in Indian philosophy is called purva paksh, okay? And that is that you anticipate the objections to your argument in the argument itself, so to speak, and putting it in the most condensed form. So therefore, if Gandhi argues X, Y, and Z, let me say at the outset where I think one might be able to offer a contrary view with equal plausibility, for example, and address that view within the view. I think that that can be an element of that. Now there's a different element. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm giving you nuggets here, I'm giving you different ways in which I might think about it. But speaking directly to the question of dissent, my view here is, especially when it comes to the state, I think we have the onus on us to be profoundly suspicious of the state, because I think the argument that has been made, which as I said, is by no means novel to Gandhi, that part of it, which is that the state represents organized violence, okay? In the most deadly form, that argument has many predecessors. There are many European intellectuals who had a very clear understanding then who advanced that argument as well. But of course, Gandhi is very different because Gandhi is also working with an intimate knowledge, not only of Western European intellectual traditions, but Indian traditions as well. It has often been su suggested that Gandhi was, Nera Chaudhary took that view, V.S. Naipaul took that view, and there are many in, in India who have taken the view that Gandhi was singularly ill-read. I think that that is a singularly ill-informed view, actually. I think Gandhi was actually quite well-read. For example, the position that he adopted on the Palestinians is extraordinary. It is so insightful that there are even Jewish writers today who will tell you that the best thing that was ever written is what Gandhi wrote. When he wrote a piece called The Jews, 2nd November, 1938, how did he derive his views on the Jews? It's extraordinary. He knew exactly what to say. All right, and I'm here, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna describe his whole views because that's another subject, a lecture, a subject for another lecture. But what I'm suggesting here is that when we, look, for example, at the whole question of dissent. Uh, apart from everything I've said, my view is that one must have, number one, a pro profound suspicion of the state. I think the, the general instinct we should follow is the instinct that you have to always question, mm. not just the state, but you have to question the authority of texts and derive an understanding from your own reasoning. All right, if I had to put it in the broadest terms. And this has also meant that one sometimes makes enemies of those who are friends as well. And this is a subject for a very long discussion, but I think that the, that I will, I'll give you an illustration of where in India, I think particularly things have become very difficult, not in the way in which we just imagine that is a state cracking down and all of that. Yes, that's there. They have become difficult for a long period of time, long before the present administration came to power. Let it be said very clearly. And here I'm not speaking about party politics or anything of that kind. About 20 years ago, I wrote a very long article. All right. And the article is called Intolerance for Hindu Tolerance. See, 
the Hindus have long believed. When I say long, I mean since the late 19th century at least, since the late 19th century. I believed and I've argued that we are a uniquely tolerant people. We are a uniquely tolerant people. There is no civilization such as ours, but certainly when it comes to the matter of tolerant, we are very tolerant. And they will cite you passages from the, going back to the Rig Veda and then from other Hindu texts, All right? Now, what does one do with that view? What is interesting is, of course, that the view has been critiqued by those on the progressive side. Okay, when progressive, secular, because they say this is just Hindu conceit. Hindus are just as conceited. For example, if Hindus are so tolerant, how does one begin to think about the caste system? Have we not oppressed the Dalits for 3000 years or whatever number of years it is, right? And in short, without getting into all the details, right? They'll, they'll say that. What is interesting, and that's what people don't understand, is that the Hindu right also has repudiated explicitly the idea of Hindu tolerance. And you say to yourself, why would that be the case? Well, yes, because the Hindu right says it is this Hindu tolerance that made us vulnerable. They came and raped and pillaged and looted because we were all the time doing bhakti. bhakti. You read Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, he has a fantastic essay where you can see that. He says, this is bhakti is what ruined us. Our tolerance ruined us. It made us vulnerable to the Christians, the Europeans, the Greeks, the Muslims, who we have had enough of this tolerance. We don't want this. And they are acting it out now. But my position was actually, there is, I think, a notion of tolerance in our civilization. We have to understand how it worked. We had a tradition of hospitality, which was quite distinct. To be hospitable to the other now can be read in many ways. So. I would say to you, long answer, but you, it was a very broadly framed question. I would say the fundamental onus on us, on me as a teacher, is I try to teach my students how to be hospitable to the other, to even host the other within yourself. Okay. I've got a similar that, question, uh, Vinay. I've got questions to be asked you. Uh, yeah. I'm coming back to text. A student asked, if you were to imagine a group of individuals to carry on the legacy of Dr. Ambedkar in advocating the cause of the marginalized, what do you think an average individual would look like? If I had to carry on the legacy of what would an average individual look like? Such an individual. The average individual, if one wanted to carry on his legacy, would look very much <laughs> would look very much like the statues of Ambedkar. What do I mean by that? Let me explain. Let me explain. Every statue, nearly every statue of Ambedkar that you see in India, you see him holding a book. What is that book? It is not, by the way, the annihilation of caste or the riddles of Hinduism. It is the constitution of India. What Ambedkar would like to see if the legacy carried on is a constitutional figure. And that is, of course, precisely the difficulty. Because as I pointed out to you, look what Ambedkar says. He says, in a Constitutional democracy such as ours, there can be no room for unconstitutional methods, violent or nonviolent. He says that unequivocally, and he says it repeatedly and insistently. And I have to say, I disagree. I, for reasons that I've already adumbrated in my view. But he very much in that sense was a person who advocated for a kind of a constitutional figure, right? That would be, I would say, that legacy, that's what 
the person would look like. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, minimizing inequality, yeah. overcoming discrimination is the hallmark of both the uh, protagonists that you were talking in terms of Ambedkar and yeah. Gandhi. Uh, how would you suggest, what would you suggest to students to develop what kind of skills to learn how to minimize inequality, both inequality of all types? What That's a very students? difficult question. I'll tell you why. First thing is that before I have the moral authority to speak on that, see, one should have some moral authority to speak on these questions. I don't have the moral authority really to speak on that kind of question, let me say that very clearly, because we are clearly living in an unequal world where I am, um, by any yardstick, in a very privileged position. I hold a professorship with a, a very handsome remuneration and in one of the richest countries of the world. All right. And so clearly, uh, it is important to recognize the limitations of whatever view I might put forward. Okay, I, I think I want to say that very clearly, uh, much in the way in which I today tell my students that they should question everything I say also because I believe that even though I was educated in what are now considered to be some of the greatest universities in the world, all right, like the University of Chicago, where I did my doctorate, uh, one of the preeminent universities, I believe my education was grossly deficient. For example, as someone who is a lover of books and who has a massive library, I should know how to build a bookshelf. And I don't. I don't know how to work with my hands. Right? And that, you see, Gandhi thought of all of that. All of that. Gandhi, the spinning, why did he do the spinning? A lot of the intellectuals say this is for you know people who are not educated, why should we have to do all of this? But the philosophy of hands, the ethics of the hands is very central to Gandhi. No one really has studied that, if you ask me. Okay. There were lots of reasons why he did that, not just because he wanted to make sure that Indians could derive a modest living given the poor circumstances in which they live, the usual circumstances, self-reliance and this and that. There are lots of other reasons for that as well, okay? So I, I want to say, first of all, that, that this is uh, the limitation of the view that I'm going to put forward now. So how does, how would, how would I teach my students how to think about inequality, right? That is what you're, what and you're how really to minimize asking. It. And how to, how minimize, to minimize it. it. Yeah, how to minimize it. So I think we have to think about, by the way, equity and equality are, are not the same thing. I think we need to think about equity more, more than equality um, <clears throat> because you can obviously uh, give five people who come from five very different backgrounds the same tools and you will not get the same outcomes because they're not starting on the same level. And that's why equity becomes very important, right? That sometimes uh, equity is desirable in order to actually make an outcome of equality possible. All right, but let's just let's just take the question at the at the root level, uh, at the common sense level, so to speak. Um, I, I think that you see it would depend really on what one is really conversing about. So, for example. Let's take a subject which all of us, all of us should be centrally interested in. Because if we don't think enough about it and do something about it, there'll be nothing to think about. And I'm talking about climate change. It is a central fundamental question. And so therefore thinking about equality here would mean you would have to start thinking about your own levels of consumption. See, let me put it again in a different framework because I, I think it's always important to bring the philosophical historical component. There are many ways to describe the difference between Mohandas Gandhi and Rubindro Tagore. Let's take that example now. Okay. See, the Indian anthropologist Surajit Sinha many years ago made one very prescient observation. I wish the insight had been mine, it's not, it's his. 
he said that, you know, Rabindranath at the end of the day is a bit of an aesthete, aesthete. That is that he's, aesthetics is a fundamental consideration and he's always thinking in lofty terms. You know, when you read him, even in Bangla, Bangla and English both, it's all kind of woolly headed. You know, it's, you know, things are, you know, there are these terms, they're floating around, you know, life is, you know, mystical, this, that. Uh, see, Tagore's Rabindranath's idea of equality was you lift everyone up to the same level. Gandhi's was you have to lower some people down. Because you're never going to be able to lift everyone. Let's just be very clear about that. And if you lift everyone up to the level of the Americans, well, everyone will weigh 400 pounds and everyone will be driving Hummers on the street. And within one year, there'll be nothing left. And that is why Gandhi said in 1931, he said if a small island nation, England, had to strip us bare to give its people the standard of living they have. He said, imagine what we would have to do if we wanted to give all our people that standard of living that they have in England. That is the fundamental problem now. Because of course, how do you prevent the aspirations of the Indians and the Chinese and the Africans who all want to rise to that same level of consumption? It is going to be a catastrophic disaster. It means that there are some people who will have to be pulled down. And this is where, notwithstanding all the suspicion of the state that one may have, one may say that the state may have to step in. Gandhi, of course, had his whole theory of trusteeship. And, I, and you can interpret that both in the technical sense, because it has to do with equality, or you can uh, interpret in the wider sense. In the technical sense, I'm afraid trusteeship has a far too benign view of human beings. But you see, the theory of trusteeship that Gandhi advocated was profound if one understands it in the other register. The whole question of climate change today is already being addressed by Gandhi in a different way because he's saying we have to understand that we hold this earth in trust for the future generations. And therefore we have to be wise about how we use our resources. I wrote an article 22 years ago it's called Too Deep for Deep Ecology. At that point, there was something called deep ecology, which was a radical ecological view. They critiqued the environmentalists for being too conservative, actually. And I argue that Gandhi was even more radical than the deep ecologists. And, and one or two of them understood that. You know. So therefore, going back to your question, this is a very large complex set of issues. I've tried to see, give you different ways in which you could come into thinking about how we would address this question of equality. If I were minimizing it. teaching my students. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my last uh, question to you, it's not a question, it's more of a request. Given your scholarship, given your astuteness, given the breadth of your thinking, can you tell us both as faculty and as students, one important reading that we should carry away, carry away from your discussion. One important reading. And you well, can be I assured think, we'll bring it to I, our library. I think, well, uh, you mean my reading or by someone? Uh, by, no, by, by anyone, someone. anyone, if you're reading. Well, well, I, I think that, well, the book I would say that is a manifesto for our, that everyone should know. I, I think the, the college should have everyone read it and should have it discussed openly is Hind Swaraj. I think that that's a fundamental book. Um, but I would say that if you had to take a modern Indian intellectual, um, and I would recommend his, one of his books, I would say Ashish Nandi's The Intimate Enemy is still an extraordinary work. And I would also say um, that to think 
in categories that you've never thought of before. Never thought of, really. Take somebody like James Scarce, C-A-R-S-E. He was an American philosopher of religion. I had the great good fortune of knowing him. Um, and he wrote a book called Finite and Infinite Games. Games, G-A-M-E-S, finite and infinite games. It'll be a puzzle for many students when they first read it. It's a very extraordinary book and will make one think about the categories through which one thinks about the world and will make us realize that we are all finite players who dread the infinite game. You see, it's like sports. And America is a particularly notorious example of a country that cannot tolerate the idea of a game that ends in a draw. So, you know, if you're playing professional basketball, professional hockey, professional football, you know, you cannot end in a draw. I hope you know that. It's not possible. Because if at the end of regulation time, the game ends at a, with the score match, let's say basketball, 100 each, what happens? It goes into overtime. And if at the end of overtime, it goes into second overtime, third overtime, fourth overtime, there must be a winner. There must be a winner. So long as we keep on operating with the language of winners and losers, which was, by the way, the favorite language of this disgraced American called Donald Trump, right? Because that's the only language he knew, winners and losers. And of course, he was always a winner. He's never yet admitted to ever losing. Note that by that, not yet do anything, right? See, infinite game continues. There are no winners or losers. And Kars invites us to a form of thinking, which is an infinite game. That's, I think, where we get the pleasures of thinking and reflecting and conversing and all that. And may you make us wiser with suggesting one of your readings. Oh, I don't know. I, 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 I well, especially along the lines of climate change, you seem no, to be. No, I, I, that. I wouldn't want to do that because I don't think that any of my re reading uh, writings come up to the standard of that I have indicated. So I think I would have to be beg to be excused from recommending any of my works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you for enlightening us. Thank, thank you for bringing down to earth those two very big giants, uh, Ambedkar and Gandhi. Yeah. and showing that they had differences. And because they had differences, they could also come together and agree to disagree. So thank you very much, Vinay. Sure, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much, all of you, for listening. I think the, manage, the students will take over again. Before we end, I would just like to say a big thank you to everyone who made today a success. On behalf of the organizing team, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to firstly, our esteemed speaker, Professor Vinay Lal, for sharing his expertise and shedding light on the themes of protest, democracy, and the relevance of PR Ambedkar today. Thank you, sir, for sharing your invaluable time with us. We're all extremely grateful to you. I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to the moderator of today's event, Dr. Egnello, who was the bridge between the speaker and the audience. A huge thank you to our principal, Dr. Mr. Rajendra Shinde, Rector Father Ki D'Souza, and the DIRS head teacher, Professor Ratha. I would also like to thank my core committee, without whom today would not have been possible. And lastly, but definitely not the least, a huge, huge thank you to our esteemed audience. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Welcome. Shall we start leaving, Jill? Vinay, thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah, uh, sure. Sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you. It was very rich. Very rich. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All Keith. right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank bye. you so much. Bye -bye. Thanks, Father. Bye -bye. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.